what we speak about in the way of opiate dependence is what we call biopsychosocial illness. One's biological or physiological makeup, physio physiological makeup, so one's physical appearance. One's psychological well-being, meaning how they're perceiving the world and others. And of course, socially, how they're interacting with other people and who those other people are. Um, so I think it's really important for parents or for loved ones to take a look to see if their child or um, their family member is having issues with heroin or other opiates, is to look at that physical appearance. Um, there's a couple of things that happen far along the progression of opiate dependence, um, what we call ADL skills, activities of daily living. So uh, personal hygiene tends to take a loss, uh, the brushing of one's teeth, uh, personal grooming, the combing of one's hair. You have to understand that opiate dependence as a psychiatric illness becomes this type of obsession and compulsion. Obsessions are recycled thoughts. I need another. I need another. And they lead to compulsions, which are repeated behaviors. I take another, whether it's nasally or intravenously. I take another. I take another. And of course, narcotics like heroin or other opiates, the most powerful drugs on the planet. So this becomes all-consuming in their focal point, And of course, their physical health uh, or appearance tends to be compromised. So when we talk about activities of daily living, uh, not showering regularly, um, because uh, opiates can often be an appetite suppressant, um, they tend to lose some weight and look very gaunt. Um, sleep patterns get thrown off, either what we call hyper or hypo. Too much sleep because of the lethargy that opiates bring, and sometimes they refer to it as the nod. People tend to nod out. Remember, opiates are painkillers, which means they suppress bodily functions. Okay, so they slow down heart rate, they slow down thoughts per minute, and for some, they tend to appear very lethargic and slow moving. Even speech gets very slowed and, uh, and tried. Um, so some of the physical appearances that you'll see would be the weight loss, the too much or too little sleep, um, obviously not really venturing outdoors, so some kind of a pale or grayish look because people tend to want to be in the privacies of their own homes or in someone's home when they use um, opiates, particularly heroin. Uh, and it becomes this very private thing. Uh, less and less it becomes a social piece, although initially it is, but we'll get to that. Psychologically, um, we always ask as healthcare professionals, it's not what people use, although we collect that data, and certainly more people are using opiates or heroin than ever before we've been keeping records on Long Island. It's why they use it. And there's a whole host of reasons that people um, use heroin. Um, primarily, if you look at what opiates were created for, um, for pain. Yes, they are great physical painkillers because they, um, they negate that chemical in our bodies and in our brains that cause physical pain. So they are great physical painkillers. But I think we're seeing a national crisis, and certainly here on Long Island, because they're also great emotional painkillers. So what kind of emotional pain could young people or human beings in 2015 engage in? Well, there's a whole host of them. And uh, being part of the human experience, most human beings can put their fingers on them. Financial insecurity. Uh, social acceptance, and now with social media, that becomes a whole new dimension for adolescents, right? Uh, family function or dysfunction uh, in a highly competitive world. Uh, being tuned in to social media and being inundated by um, what can be challenging stimuli, meaning that we're seeing wars on two fronts for 14 years. You read about economic repressions or depressions, uh, unemployment rates, the cost of college, you know. We're inundated by this information, and in fact, there's a lot of models around depression that one of the things that they suggest is, from healthcare providers to patients, is please stop watching the news and some of the negative sensationalism that's out there. Now, how do I tie this into opiate dependence or heroin addicts? Um, they're often looking to numb their pain, uh, and that pain's very real. Um, obviously, there are healthier ways to work through pain or discomfort, but maybe it's no coincidence that as the world has sped up exponentially, that many of us uh, are plugged in digitally and could be uh, um, on social media or dealing with one's social existence maybe 18, 20 hours a day if you're a young person. That could be very challenging. Um, so psychologically, why are people engaged in substance use? Well, I think it's important for individuals as they enter the recovery process to really take a look at, um, yes, what drugs they use, but what purpose did it serve them? And ultimately, people are trying to medicate a whole host of, of issues, if you will, and we went some of, uh, through some of them. And the last piece is socially. So for parents or for loved ones or family members, when you see that social group begin to change, 
Um, I always ask, and we're seeing over a thousand people a month here at the Long Island Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. I always ask young people, do you remember the days when you said that you wouldn't engage in substance use? And I don't say there's a judgment, but everyone has that line that they remember. That they didn't want to get into drugs in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. They were into sports, they were into academics, they were into a healthy socialization like recreational activities that were outdoors, exercise, and then they crossed that imaginary line um, usually with one of the three gateway drugs, nicotine, marijuana, and a very potent form of marijuana, and alcohol. Alcohol still continues to uh, afflict young people and kill off young people at record levels we, than all of the drugs combined. So when one's social group begins to change, um, when one cannot engage in socialization without this, and listen to the difference between these two statements, and they're profoundly different. You know, at the end of the week, after a stressful week, if I take a few opiates, whether it's Percodent or Vicodin or heroin, I find that I could just relax. And then in a very short amount of time, at the end of the week, I can't relax without opiates. That's a very different statement. One's based on what we used to call recreational or choice use. And then the latter is more of a necessity that I can't manage my anxiety. I can't manage my uh, insecurities in interacting with people without medicating myself. And um, that's a very, very um, not so subtle continuum. And what we're seeing that's different, and I've been in drug treatment for 20 years, is young people are going from experimental drug use at 12, 13, 14 years old, and they're making a very quick leap at 14, 15, 16 to the most powerful narcotics on the face of the planet, like opiates, i.e. heroin, which is an opiate. So when we look at those life areas, um, one's physical, one's psychological, and social makeup, um, if we were to break those down further, physical, interpersonal, meaning friends or family or social group, right? Uh, academic or vocational, is one doing well at work or at school? We always say, and we advise parents and loved ones, when the A student becomes a D student, when the B student becomes an F student, um, if you're not working on something, something's working on you. And at the height of a national crisis around um, uh, substance use, prescription drugs, alcohol, marijuana abuse, substance use in general, you definitely want to ask the right questions. Um, not as a judgment or a ha-ha, I found you out, but we're trying to stop a healthcare epidemic here. Early intervention is key. So um, those life areas are very, very important for people to assess. Now, for parents who are watching this or loved ones who are watching this, you may say, hmm, that sounds like adolescence in 2015. What, they sleep too much, their social groups change. Yes, adolescence in the time of human development is a time for risk taking. It is in fact a time for character and personality development. It is a time for developing one's own persona and sometimes that means taking risks and uh, shifting one's taste in music, one's hairstyle. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, any parent will tell you who's raised an adolescent that it can be a tumultuous time in human development and we could think back to our age too, right? Um, so it, sometimes it could seem to mirror substance use. But at the height of a national crisis, it's really important to ask the right questions, not only of your loved one or of your child, but sometimes of healthcare professionals. Um, I, think parents, uh, I think parents can't afford to say, it's only alcohol and it's only marijuana anymore. Um, we had a parent come into this office looking somewhat bewildered and wide-eyed in our waiting room, s holding her handful of material, and I said, could I help you? She said, what are these? I said, those are syringes. She says, well, what are they doing in my 15-year-old's room? And of course, someone didn't just wake up and say, today's the day I try heroin. It happens on a continuum. That continuum from experimental drug use to misuse to dependence is happening in a third of the time we used to see it. From 13 to 18, 20, 10 years ago, now they're in the muddy end of substance use or substance dependence at 14, 15, 16. And if you think that potentially with educational, with early intervention, that some people, that progression can be either staved off or could be intervened upon, I think it's really important for early intervention.